I started to see the phrase, the modern exorcist, as a bit of a meme after years and years of movies marketing themselves with a quote along those lines. It was never true, not just because those movies that did that weren't nearly as good as The Exorcist, but also because a huge part of the reason that movie has stayed ingrained in the zeitgeist is for its cultural impact, and that's a spot that no movie really could touch. And then came Hereditary. The feature film directorial debut of auteur director Ari Aster released in 2018, and I will never forget the buzz when it came out. It felt like one of those movies that only comes along once every 20 years where it shakes up an entire genre, and it stuck around long enough to see itself be considered one of the best horror movies ever made. The modern exorcist is a phrase that's been used a lot, but hereditary truly is the closest thing we've had to that culturally. Good evening. My name's Evan, and welcome to Rockland Graves. I've wanted to dive into Hereditary for a long time now, and I've recently been getting a bunch of requests to cover it, so I figured I'd finally saddle up and analyze one of the most impactful horror films to release in the last 20 years. I've talked a bit in the past about how there are certain movies that are so iconic and so intricate in their design that it makes talking about them a little intimidating, and this is definitely one of those. Hereditary is one of the most detailed and meticulously crafted movies the genre has ever seen, and as a directorial debut, it is truly mind-blowing. Astor caught the attention of A24 after his two short films, The Strange Thing About the Johnsons and Munchausen allowed him to show off his very distinct style, and after getting an initially reluctant Tony Collette on board for the film after she saw how beautifully written it was, the production was given a $10 million budget and began filming. A24 is generally a distributor, they'll find projects that they think fit their vibe, and they will acquire them and they'll act as distributor, but they don't generally produce unless there's some proven names attached to the project, and Colette's involvement was certainly a big help. Since its release, it settled itself comfortably in its reputation for being one of the best horror movies ever made. That sort of talk gets thrown around way too much, but every once in a while a movie comes around that does earn that sort of title, and I think Hereditary does. Since its release in 2018, the amount of horror movies that try and take this more thematically driven approach through dark trauma-related exploration has absolutely skyrocketed, and even Astor's visual style has bled into these movies. Hell, this was the thing that really kicked off the elevated horror trend, and whether or not you like the movie, you can't deny its cultural significance. I've been looking forward to this one for a long time, so let's take a closer look at this horror titan. Before that, though, I want to thank my wonderful Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. These videos take a lot of time and energy to make and the extra support really helps to keep things moving. If you're interested in getting some bonus material and accessing private supporter only polls or getting early access to the big videos, consider supporting me on either platform. Thanks again, let's get into it. <laughs> Hi Lily! How did you do that? <laughs> the reason that I think Hereditary is the most deserving thing being dubbed this generation's The Exorcist isn't because of its horror scenes. Similar to The Exorcist, this movie works because of how incredibly well written it is and how it uses its characters for very deep and effective thematic exploration. This is a family drama above all else, and it uses a story about cults and demons as a way to explore its ideas. It had been a while since I'd seen Hereditary, and the thing that really struck me is that the most frightening moments of this movie by a very wide margin had nothing to do with the supernatural, but instead in the way it portrayed this broken and traumatized family in such a harrowing and real realistic manner. Getting a little ahead of myself, but that's absolutely something we're going to focus on quite a bit because it's the thing that makes this movie so special and honestly what Ari Aster is best at. The story of Hereditary isn't necessarily an overly complicated one, but as with most good stories, it's a fairly straightforward idea elevated with brilliant execution on all fronts. Essentially, what we're watching unfold here is a plan set in motion by Annie's mother, Ellen, who is the queen bee of a cult-worshipping Payment, the ninth king of hell who's been mentioned in various historical texts for centuries. This cult that Ellen was involved with has been searching for a human host for Payment, and while Peter ultimately becomes the target of this throughout the course of the movie, Movie, it's made clear during a very revealing monologue from Annie at a group therapy session for people grieving family members that Peter is not the first to be targeted as this potential host. 
My older brother had schizophrenia, and when he was 16, he hanged himself in my mother's bedroom, and of course, his suicide note blamed her, accusing her of putting people inside him. Ari Aster does a very good job at calling into question the reliability of not just the side characters in his movie, but also the ones whose eyes were moving through the story with. Revealing this history of very disturbing and severe mental health issues in Annie's family does a few things that go a long way for calling into question a lot of the events that unfold throughout the rest of the movie. And well, I'm not saying that the whole thing is a, you know, all hallucinations brought on by the intense schizophrenia that runs in Annie's bloodline. There's enough sprinkled in these moments that could definitely lean towards that being the case. I think that Steve's position as the only one who manages to keep a level head is something that definitely lends itself to that possibility, since he's not blood related to Annie. The cult is certainly real, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the supernatural occurrences are, since we're seeing this movie through the lens of someone with a strong family history of mental health issues. I think it's a really interesting angle to ponder, and what I love about it is that, as far as I can tell, there isn't any one detail in the movie that gives a definitive answer one way or another. It's clear early on that there is some tension in this family, primarily between Peter and Annie. It's incredible how well that tension is set up entirely through one interaction between them that isn't even an argument. There's just this strained feeling between the two of them that you pick up on right away simply through the tempo of the conversation and the incredible performances. Every single interaction feels significant, even when the implications of the conversations have absolutely nothing to do with the actual topic at hand. This is just Peter asking if he can borrow the car and go to a party, and Annie questioning him about drinking before getting him to bring his sister Charlie along since she doesn't do a whole lot of socializing. But what this scene is really doing is demonstrating this awkward wall that seems to be stuck firmly between Peter and his mother. We learn later on many of the reasons that this tension is present between them, going all the way back to Annie not even wanting to be a mother in the first place and intentionally trying to have a miscarriage during her pregnancy. Annie has shown signs of carrying some of her family's psychiatric issues throughout Peter's life, and it doesn't need to be spelled out how the combination of not wanting to be a parent while also potentially having a pretty shaky grasp on reality could lead to some unfortunate moments between the parents and the child. We do learn about one of those moments where Annie was sleepwalking and awoke to find that she'd covered Peter in lighter fluid and was holding a lit match. Annie immediately goes on to say that this was nothing more than sleepwalking, but of course there's so much more said by this moment than she would say out loud. And it's not hard to imagine what else has happened between the two of them that would leave them with this strained relationship that we see now. Whatever wall has stood tall between Annie and Peter is smashed to bits with a wrecking ball in one of the most horrifying sequences in modern horror. Charlie's death was one of those theater moments where everyone is just dead silent. I remember getting a bad feeling that something was going to happen to her when I noticed that all of the shots of her that were in the trailer came really early on, which is never a good sign. Charlie set up as this very timid, self-isolating kid, but it's clear that there's something more going on with her when she cuts the head off a bird to use as a part of her arts and crafts project. The something more is that Charlie is essentially the demon payment that Ellen had been trying to find a host for for so long. Annie had isolated Peter from Ellen because of her history of getting into people's minds in ways that seemed to irreversibly damage them, and as a sort of apology, Annie allowed Ellen to be around Charlie, but came to regret it. I didn't let her anywhere near me when I had my first, my son, which is why I gave her my daughter, who she immediately stabbed her hooks into. Ellen's series of unsuccessful attempts at finding a host for Payman finally went as planned with Charlie, but Payman is male and is therefore covetous of a male host, so Charlie wasn't the best fit. She was just the closest thing that Lee could find for the time being, and she had to plan to eventually transfer Payman to Peter after using Charlie as a carrier. So Charlie's strange behavior isn't the result of an awkward or neurodivergent child, it's because she's actually a demon who was allowed to overtake Charlie's body from the time she was a baby. This is how Hereditary sets up this sense of inevitability with the fate of the Graham family. This goes back so far, and none of them are even remotely aware of the fact that they've all been nothing more than playing their parts in this plan to provide a demon a proper host body. They're simply pawns in someone else's game, and it's a horrifying realization. This movie does a great job at setting up a feeling of being unwelcome in the places where you're supposed to feel secure, whether that be the comfort of your own home, the intended safety of school, or even in your own body. There's this disgusting control from this cult that has zero regard for the people it's using to achieve its goals, and that constantly increasing sense that there's just nowhere to go and nothing to do that 
won't be a part of what they want is really unsettling once you pick up on it. I think that Payman's sigil being etched into the exact telephone pole that Charlie's head collides with is the perfect way of showing how little control the Grams actually have over their own lives. Giving Payman Charlie's body when she was a kid was the first step in the plan, and in the years since, this cult has been building up to the moment when they can finally proceed on to the next. Aster does too good of a job at creating very tangible dread, and the way he slowly builds up to that in this crescendo is one of the tougher sequences out there. The whole buildup of this sequence feels like a precarious Jenga game that Aster planned on pulling the bottom piece from once enough was stacked up to make the fall really hurt. Annie suggesting that Charlie go to the party with Peter, him shoving her off to eat something we know will cause an allergy attack so he can go get high, and then having to drive to rush her to the hospital after she comes looking for him with one of the most disturbing one-liners I've ever heard. I think my throat's getting bigger. These are all the pieces that he's adding on to this stack. None of this feels contrived either, which is really impressive considering how many moving parts had to come together in order to get them into this situation. And Aster pulls that bottom piece with a scene that instantly became infamous. And for good reason. <laughs> Putting us right in Peter's shoes and seeing this scene through his perspective is the perfect way to have this play out. His moment of frozen terror as his brain tries to process what just happened, and his inability to look in the back seat before slowly driving off is such a masterfully executed sequence that leaves a substantial impact. It's really hard to watch, even after six years, six years, holy shit. It still hasn't lost its punch. It's horrifying, and it's made worse by how well Aster is able to portray the sharp blade of grief in an uncomfortably realistic and unrelenting way. That's the thing that's most terrifying about Hereditary. Yes, it's got its moments where there's spooky shit going on, of course, but the thing that makes this movie so uniquely disturbing is its portrayal of the iciness of grief and the way it can tear you to shreds. Annie's reaction to Charlie's death might be the toughest moment of the entire movie for me to get through. It all gets so much worse when we find out that the cult is taking advantage of their grief and had planned on it being an integral part of what they've been working on. That's another way this movie takes what should be a safe haven and twisted into actively hurting the characters. Even the people Annie finds that at first seem empathetic and understanding turn out to be involved, effectively placing these characters in a situation where no matter which direction they turn, they're always faced with something that doesn't just happen to make their lives worse, but is actively working on doing so and betting on it. It's a really disturbing spiral that makes the hopelessness this family is engulfed by feel all the more real. The wall that was between Annie and Peter is shattered, but in its place a deep, dark, and empty cavern has formed with nothing but a thin tightrope bridging the two sides. And that precarious walk over the rope only results in the rope stretching. That all comes to a head in what I've always found to be the most challenging scene of the entire movie, that being the dinner scene. So much of the pent-up emotion of these characters is let loose in an incredibly disturbing scene that feels equal parts tragic and horrifying, in large parts thanks to the harrowing performance from Toni Collette. The way she uses her face throughout the whole movie, but this scene in particular, can result in such gut-wrenching dread, and it's a goddamn crime that she didn't get so much as a nomination for this scene alone. Peter feels trapped by the words that Annie has been refusing to say to him, so when he prods a little more than he maybe should have, the quiet albeit incredibly awkward and tense, dinner explodes into this heartbreaking outpour from both of them. I wish I could shield you from the knowledge that you did what you did. It becomes clear that Annie has some blame for Peter with what happened to Charlie, which has got to be one of the worst things you can possibly hear from your parents, so Peter slips his tongue again. She didn't want to go to the party. So why was she there? To me, this really is the most unnerving scene of the movie, because this isn't anything supernatural or cult-related. The horror in this scene is simply the way it demonstrates how brutally grief is tearing these people apart, not just as individuals, but as a family unit that had already been strained to start with. This is a scene that's made horrifying, with nothing more than incredibly real human emotion perfectly conveyed through the all-too-real performances. That's indicative of the movie as a whole. Steve is, in my opinion, possibly the most important character in this movie, largely because he serves as an audience surrogate that gives us a more stable pair of eyes to see the movie through. He's the most level-headed character who's basically just trying to course correct and keep the boat from rocking too much at every point, so 
While Annie is trying to summon Charlie's spirit and Peter's smashing his face against his desk in class, Steve's more grounded character pulls you into his shoes pretty effortlessly. I love the nuance in how he operates because it's not just that he's a pushover who just takes everything on the chin and tries to play Switzerland, he just knows how to pick his battles really well. When he sees there's no use, he just lets something go. But when he's got a stance to take, he lets it be known and stands firmly on where he lands. You're not planning on letting him see that, are you? Who? No. Peter. What do you think he's gonna feel when he sees that? You can tell that he loves both Annie and Peter, but as Annie becomes more and more erratic, his priority shifts to just trying to protect Peter as best he can, which is nice, but it's another thing that just gets really sad when you realize that he's never actually gonna be successful in doing so. One of the most important scenes of the entire movie is when he's on the way to pick Peter up after the classroom incident, and after keeping up this stone wall the whole movie, his defenses fall away while he's at a red light. It's the only scene where we're shown where he's really at. Most of his time is spent trying to mediate things and keep everything at an even keel, which he does from the start of the movie when he gets a call telling him that the grave of Annie's mother was desecrated and he doesn't tell her. Just some billing crap. He's constantly trying to keep the boat from rocking too much, but in this scene we finally see the raw human moment of him just collapsing under all the pressure. The moment is placed perfectly as well, happening at such a pivotal point of the movie where his focus shifts fully to just trying to protect Peter and he decides not to play into what he sees as Annie's delusions anymore. Similar to Bill Kinderman in The Exorcist, Steve isn't the focal character of the story, but so much of the thematic material being explored is conveyed through him and his actions throughout which is why I find him to be such an effective and necessary character. And then there's Peter, the one who witnessed firsthand the death of his sister. The few scenes following the accident do such a good job at showing how Peter is sort of fading away into the background of his own life, seeing the world through distorted glass. He stands like a husk listening to Annie's reaction and becomes more distant as things go on. He seems more open to Annie's ideas about Charlie's spirit lingering on, unlike Steve, and this is another thing that opens the door to the discussion point that a lot of what happens in the movie could truly come down to this hereditary mental illness. You know what can exasperate mental health troubles and those predisposed to them because of their genetics? Cannabis use. Peter is younger than most would be when signs of schizophrenia start to show, but he's regularly using cannabis and that could cause the symptoms to show sooner than they otherwise would. Again, not saying that this is what's actually happening in the movie, but I really love how it's something that's absolutely an angle you could look at the movie from. Alex Wolf does a really good job at portraying this unwell teen really struggling through so much, showing a very vulnerable and afraid character who seems so badly in need of guidance. I know some people have trouble with how whimpery he gets at times, and I do understand that because it can be a little grating, but I think it makes perfect sense in the context of his character. He's really young, and there's so much going on, so him sometimes reverting to being a child and just wanting his parents to protect him isn't out of place. And in fact, I find those moments when he falls apart so heartbreaking because of it. I want to talk about how Hereditary uses visual storytelling, starting off with the opening shot. Hereditary to me has one of the best opening shots to any horror movie, not just because it's so visually interesting to slowly zoom in on this miniature recreation of the Graham's forest wrapped home, but also because it immediately establishes and reflects the film's story of the family essentially being pawns in someone else's game, lording over their lives and moving them around to eventually see a satanic plan come to fruition. I'll never forget seeing this for the first time and being hit with the realization that I wasn't actually looking at a miniature recreation of a bedroom and my brain had to reorient how it was interpreting everything in the room. It's such an unsettling way to open the movie and establish this lack of trust with what's being presented to you, putting you right in the family shoes without missing a beat. The visual storytelling in Astor's work is truly incredible, and I think the opening shot of Hereditary is still one of his best moments as a filmmaker. I mentioned that this movie is a little intimidating to talk about since it's such a high point for the genre, but another reason for that is the sheer amount of detail in pretty much every scene is genuinely staggering. There's so much in the way of thematic and narrative implications in that opening shot alone, and when we get to the funeral for Annie's mother, there's once again so many important little details. From the insignia on her mother's clothes, the people present at the funeral, the things Annie says about her mother's behavior, and setting up Charlie's nut allergy, as well as establishing the clucking sounds she makes. You could always count on her to always have the answer. In this short scene, the movie sets up at least five significant details for the film's story, 
all without shoving it down your throat and making it too obvious. This is one of the most richly detailed scripts I have ever seen, and it's already showing its face barely five minutes into the movie. Two-hour horror movies can very easily feel like they've got some fluff, but with the amount of significant details throughout pretty much every moment, that two-hour runtime finds itself stuffed to the brim with just the essential elements for this story and basically no filler, which is incredibly impressive. It's this sort of thing that makes the movie such an unprecedented directorial debut. This sort of detail also heavily rewards re-watching the movie because you're gonna be picking up on little things that you might have missed the first time around, either because you simply didn't notice them or because you didn't have the necessary context to know they were significant until after going through the story in its full picture. Payman's sigil is scattered all throughout the movie, but there are also things like the cult members being spotted around the house at various points of the movie where you could very easily miss them. It's not just little details that make every frame feel so significant though, it's the way Aster uses visual storytelling to portray the themes of the movie. Like the moment I mentioned previously when Peter is stood behind the glass at Charlie's funeral and sees the world in the a strange distorted way through it beautifully communicating the dazed and disconnected state he's in. It's things like this and that fantastic opening shot where Aster so perfectly communicates things without directly saying them or shoving them down your throat, and that sort of storytelling forces you to sit in with the characters and become more engrossed in the world. It's so captivating. Using Annie's miniatures as a way to show how she's trying to work through things, but also to deliver some backstory without expository dialogue dumping it all in our laps, this is such good filmmaking. Aster also has an incredibly strong grasp on when to show something and when to leave it up to your imagination, and if he does choose to show it to you, he knows exactly when the right time to reveal it is. We never see Annie discover Charlie's body. All we see is the husk of Peter laying on the bed staring into a void as we hear her anguished screams, and it's not until the next day that we're shown Charlie's head on the pavement. It's through a mission and carefully timed reveals that he pulls you right into the story, and it's amazing to witness. I don't know, maybe at some point I might have to consider just doing a video like breaking down all the little details in this story, not getting into it all here because this is more of a broad look at the movie. So that's all great. The characters are so well realized, the acting is incredible from every single person involved. The use of visual storytelling and deep understanding of pacing certain reveals makes for one of the most well-crafted narratives the genre has to offer. But is it actually scary? This is one of those movies that's always in the discussion when people talk about the scariest movies ever made, and I think there's a lot to be said for this being part of that list. However, I think that similar to The Exorcist, whether you find this movie underwhelming or one of the scariest movies you've seen will depend largely on not just your expectations going in, but also how invested you get in the story and its characters. If you go into this expecting that the movie will just hand you its scares on a silver platter, you might walk away feeling disappointed because in order for you to get to the point where Hereditary truly gets under your skin and sticks with you, requires that you get invested in the story and not just the scares. A lot of the truly terrifying elements of this movie that cause people to walk away from it so deeply shaken have to do with the sense of dread and hopelessness in the situation that this family finds themselves in, and in the way that Aster portrays this family being torn apart by so many factors that are largely out of their control. There are scare sequences that are more blatantly frightening, but the overall impact that made this movie such a huge deal when it came out wasn't those moments, it was the harrowing portrayal of grief and utter hopelessness. That being said, the direct scare sequences are all very well crafted and very importantly, are all significant to the story. Too often you'll find horror movies that just throw scare scenes in there and they don't carry much weight in the actual story itself, but in Hereditary these moments are all integral and really do mean something. The seance at Joan's house is obviously a lot more sinister in hindsight than it seems at first, but even before we have more information about who she is, this scene does such a good job at really creating this eerie moment that realistically portrays the whirlwind of emotions someone would surely be feeling if they were being exposed to such a potent display of the supernatural for the first time. There's beauty and horror in equal parts. One of the biggest contributing factors to the effectiveness of this scene is the score from Colin Stetson, which for my money, th this dude is one of the best composers working right now. The music is unsettling for a multitude of reasons, but I think one of the most fascinating things about it is how it conflicts with what you'd expect to feel in a moment, which often makes it feel more disturbing. In scenes that would usually have an outwardly dark sound to them, Stetson sprinkles in a very unsettling, sort of hopeful joy 
with the score that feels like we're hearing the feelings of the cultists watching their horrific plan unfold. It's a very invasive feeling, and I find it fascinating to approach the score more from a perspective of the film's antagonist than the protagonist, and that's just another way this movie covers all of its bases in getting across the point that the Grams really have no control of what's playing out. This is not their world. The score in the closing scene is particularly unsettling, while also having a beauty to it. The way Stetson composes for brass and strings in particular is always wonderful, and the blends here sound eerily triumphant. As the story progresses, Peter is constantly attacked by the spirit of payment as well as the cultists as they try and push him out of his own body to make room for their savior. And after it tricks Annie and Steve winds up dead, it seems they truly succeeded in forcing Peter out when they drive him to jumping out of a window, which is the first step to his final possession. There's an activation required in the process that's alluded to earlier on in the movie, and that it seems that they never got to that point with Charlie since Payman wanted a male host body, and it seems to me that this activation is the ritual that we see in the closing moments of the movie, where Payman now resides in a more desired host body. I love how confused the look on his face is here, like he's having to reacquaint himself with this world. I also really like how Payman's possession of Peter's body brings back Charlie's tongue clucking, serving as further confirmation that Charlie was never really there from the start. Heyman always resided in her body, and now the final activation of the possession has been completed. Hereditary is a ridiculously dense and detailed movie with so much more going on than what you see on the surface, which is why it was such a cultural phenomenon when it came out back in 2018, and it's why the movie is still being analyzed six years later. The uncomfortable realism in its portrayal of grief and a family torn apart by it is one of the most harrowing depictions of that subject matter I've ever seen. The incredibly nuanced writing and masterful acting are the perfect vehicle for the story to be delivered to us, and it's all these things that left me feeling absolutely stunned as I left the theater back when this came out. This is a one-of-a-kind film that really kicked off the career of one of the most important modern horror filmmakers, and Astor continues to surprise us with each new movie. It's a crime that Toni Collette didn't get a nomination for her performance here because she easily gives one of the best performances the genre has to offer. Now, circling back to the beginning, would I call Hereditary the modern exorcist? No, I wouldn't. Partly because The Exorcist had an optimism at its core, closing the story off at a mostly positive note and trying to hammer home the message that good will always prevail, while Hereditary is about grief and hopelessness and closes off with everything going as badly as it possibly can. The main reason that I wouldn't call Hereditary the modern exorcist, though, is because I feel like that's unfair to this movie, since it very much stands on its own. Hereditary is hereditary, and since its release, it's not needed any other legs to stand on other than that. It's become a benchmark in a lot of ways, and I do think that in terms of its cultural impact, this is one of the most important horror movies of the 21st century. So there we have it! This is one of those videos that I was kind of nervous to make, since Hereditary is such a behemoth of a movie, so I hope I did it some justice. Up next, we're going to be taking a look at The Strangers, and we'll also be doing the sequel eventually, and the build-up to the new one that's coming out, but until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.